Salve citizens, and welcome to the Empire. Yeah, that's right, the Empire. By this point in history, the Republic is, for all intents and purposes, gone. Uh, yes, by name, it still sort of exists, but realistically, historians look at the point at which Julius Caesar is named dictator for life as being the moment at which the Republic ends and really unofficially the Empire begins. Of course, we also remember at the end of last session that a number of senators, led by Caesar's supposedly good friend Brutus, uh, decided to assassinate Julius Caesar, thinking that they were killing a tyrant, which really they were, but also thinking that they were somehow saving the Republic. In reality, the Republic was too far gone, and they were making its official fall just a little bit faster than it would have been otherwise. Well, today we'll pick up right where we left off in the last session with the death of Caesar, and we'll meet the guy who makes the changeover to empire absolutely official, Augustus Caesar, Rome's first real emperor. We'll find out how Julius Caesar's nephew, Octavian, rises to power to become Augustus, the first real emperor. Then we'll meet some of the men who ruled after him. In his family line, they're called the Julio-Claudian emperors. Uh, we'll see who they were and what the empire was like under their rule. Uh, after that, we'll meet a uh, number of gentlemen referred to as the Good Emperors. And realistically, once we really know the Julio-Claudians, anybody looks good compared to them. But we'll meet these Good Emperors, and we'll figure out what character uh, characterized their reign over the Empire. Finally, we'll look at a period of Roman history referred to as the Pax Romana. In Latin, Pax Romana means Roman peace. And we'll examine what it's like to live in the Roman world during this time period. Thus, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin. All right, so we start up literally right after the death of Caesar. Okay, so Caesar's been assassinated. Now, we have to remember that the Senate didn't like him, but a lot of the common people did like Caesar very, very much. And it is now the funeral of Caesar, a few days after his death. Well, the guy who gives Caesar's eulogy at the funeral is Caesar's second-in-command, a guy by the name of Mark Antony. And Mark Antony gives a very emotionally charged eulogy at the funeral that ends with Antony taking Caesar's bloodied toga that he wore when he was killed and throwing it out into the crowd. Uh, the thousands of commoners there in the forum uh, erupt into an angry, rioting mob, and who did they direct their anger at but Brutus, Cassius, and the other conspirators. The angry, rioting mob drives these men out of the city, fleeing for their lives. Many of them end up going to Greece, but for now, the mob really has uh, taken out Caesar's assassins. Well, with Caesar dead, he also has a will, and the will needs to be read. And many people thought that when the will was read, that Mark Antony would be named as the heir. So imagine everyone's surprised when instead of Mark Antony, it is Caesar's 18-year-old nephew Octavian who is named as the legal heir. And all things that belong to Caesar are now inherited by Octavian. And if Caesar ruled Rome, does that mean Octavian also inherits Rome? It's a good question. Octavian sure thinks so, because realistically, Octavian and Antony are rivals for power. But they also realize that alone, neither one of them could defeat the assassins. So they put their differences aside, uh, team up, and become good buddies to hunt down and destroy Caesar's assassins. Uh, they do so until there are only two left, Brutus and Cassius. And together, Antony and Octavian pursue Brutus and Cassius to Greece, where they meet them in battle and defeat them at Philippi in 42 BC. So the Battle of Philippi results in a great victory for Octavian and Antony, and the last defeat for Brutus and Cassius, the last of the conspirators in Caesar's death. Following the battle and their defeat, both Brutus and Cassius commit suicide, leaving Octavian and Antony as masters of the Roman world. Now, Octavian and Antony divide the Roman Empire up between the two of them, with Octavian taking the west and Antony ruling in the east. Okay, there's actually a third guy. Uh, Marcus Lepidus was his name. They kind of, they shunned him off to Africa. Uh, he was a third person, and really the three of them make a new triumvirate. Lepidus was another one of Caesar's generals, but he's really the junior partner in all of this, and it's not too long before uh, Octavian bumps him off and forces him to retire, leaving only Octavian and Antony to vie for power of the Roman world. Now, Antony rules the east, and he rules the east from Alexandria, Egypt. And it's at this time that Antony meets the famous Egyptian queen Cleopatra. Soon, they become not just politically involved, but also romantically involved. Uh, and they would stay romantically involved for the remainder of their lives. And Cleopatra would give birth to three children by Mark Antony. 
fun fact in all this, Cleopatra had also been Caesar's lover, and she gave birth to a child of his as well. Of course, all of her relationships were politically motivated. She chose them very, very carefully, and whoever was going to secure her position and keep Egypt safe and keep Egypt free. But, you know, the Roman world is still not big enough for both Antony and Octavian. Both want power, both want to be the man in Rome. And so their rivalry resurfaces once again, and the result is civil war. Again. And they would fight a very short-lived civil war in 31 BC. There would be only one major battle in this conflict. That would be the Battle of Actium, a massive naval battle off the coast of Greece, pitting Octavian's navy against the combined navy of Antony and Cleopatra. Well, victory belongs to Octavian. Uh, the remaining soldiers that Antony does have switch sides and join Octavian. And less than one year later, in 30 BC, both Antony and Cleopatra commit suicide. Octavian is now the undisputed master of the Roman Empire. Well, with his position now solidified, Octavian sets out to end Rome's century of civil war. How's he going to do this? Well, he's going to do it by consolidating all power in Rome in one person. That would be himself. So the Senate, which is now filled with the supporters of Octavian, uh, decide to appoint Octavian consul, tribune, and commander-in-chief of the military for life. And this solves a number of problems. It gets rid of the problem of generals constantly fighting each other for power. Because Rome's armies would now be loyal to one person, the commander-in-chief. And who's the commander-in-chief? Octavian. And as commander-in-chief, Octavian ensures that it is the government who pays the legions, not their generals. And so, who are the legions uh, loyal to? The government. He ensures that uh, they swear allegiance, not to their general, but to the commander-in-chief, which is who? Octavian. So we're getting rid of the problem of rival generals fighting each other for power. Additionally, Octavian has himself appointed to a position called Pontifex Maximus. This is the chief priest of the Roman religion. So everything that has any kind of power in Rome now lies in the hands of Octavian. Finally, the Senate bestows upon him uh, an, an ultimate title, the title of Augustus, which means the majestic one. And so for the rest of Roman history, Octavian, the first emperor, is referred to as Augustus Caesar. And so in spite of all of this, in spite of this incredibly powerful position that he has created, Octavian attempts to maintain the trappings of the old republic. He keeps the Senate intact, the consulship, elections, all of that stuff. He himself never holds the title of emperor. Instead, he prefers to be called the princeps, or first citizen. But despite all that, uh, this marks the true beginning of the Roman Empire. Okay, the republic is long since gone. Rome really is an empire now, ruled by an official emperor, and Octavian, slash Augustus, whatever you want to call him, is that first official emperor. And Augustus, or Octavian, uh, ruled as emperor for over 40 years, from 27 BC, when he officially became emperor, all the way up until AD 14. It's a very, very long time. Uh, during his reign, he's going to make a number of changes and reforms to Rome and the empire. He has said, and I love the quote that's over there on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, supposedly towards the end of his life, he said, I found Rome as a city of bricks, and I left it as a city of marble, a true testament to the positive changes he made, not just to the city of Rome, but to the empire in general. For example, he takes power away from the Senate. I mean, they don't have anything left at this point anyway. Uh, and he personally appoints all the proconsuls, the governors over the provinces. This prevents the proconsuls from being beholden to the Senate, hopefully prevents them from being corrupt. Uh, and furthermore, Octavian personally inspects all of these proconsuls to make sure they're doing their job. And if they don't do their job properly, he will remove them and put someone else in power who will. Additionally, he gets rid of the old publican tax collectors, the corrupt ones who were causing all the problems before, and instead replaces them with government employees who receive a wage for being tax collectors. This prevents, or at least uh, discourages, people skimming off the top, accepting bribes, things like that. Uh, it keeps them honest, and generally these changes ensure that the provinces would be run smoothly and uh, generally free of corruption. I don't want to say it's going to be perfect, but it's going to be way better than it was before. And this smoothness that, of system that is put in place is going to ensure uh, that the government runs properly, even during the years when we're going to see some not very good emperors, which, by the way, is coming up relatively soon here. Now, during his 40-plus years as emperor, Augustus proves to be a wise leader, 
and a strong administrator who not only expands the borders of the empire, he grows it economically and increases the empire's strength and stability. Many historians look at him as perhaps not just the best, but also the most popular of all of Rome's emperors. But for all of his successes, for all the great stuff he did in Rome, his biggest failure was that he was a micromanager. He micromanaged and personally managed everything, handpicked everything, including his own successor as emperor. Now, why is this a problem? Well, if he handpicks his own successor, this means he never laid down any specific law to govern how future emperors would be chosen. So future emperors would simply be chosen by whoever the current emperor was. This means there is no guarantee that the person who takes power with this, you know, immensely important position is going to be of very good quality. There's no guarantee of that. And we see that in the men who rule Rome after Octavian's death. When he died in 14 AD, the men who would hold this incredibly powerful position that he created would ultimately be of a very poor quality in the years to come. The emperors who followed after him, who were known as the Julio-Claudian emperors, were, in this order, Tiberius, this was uh, Octavian's stepson, Caligula, and by the way, we're eventually going to find out that the name Caligula is not something you want to be called in the present day. This guy is so depraved and psychotic, I'm not going into detail, but nothing good comes out of that name today. Caligula was the nephew of Tiberius. Once Caligula is killed off, his uncle Claudius becomes the new emperor. Uh, Claudius gets poisoned by his wife, and her son Nero becomes the new emperor. And if we think that Caligula is bad, Nero is even worse. The Julio-Claudian emperors are characterized by uh, psychotic behavior, torture, murder, lots of really bad, nasty stuff that we won't get into now. And yet, despite all of that, the empire continues to thrive when they're in power. It says an awful lot about the system that Octavian left in place when he died. Now, after the death of Nero, Rome is governed by a series of good emperors. Uh, they are Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, and the philosopher emperor Marcus Aurelius. These guys are called the good emperors because they're known for their skills as wise leaders, their support for large-scale building projects, expanding the empire, growing their economy. Under their leadership, the Roman Empire grows to its greatest size and experiences its greatest economic prosperity. These are the best years to live in Rome. The very height of the Roman Empire occurs under the rule of these gentlemen here. And from the time that uh, Augustus came to power in 31 BC until around 180 AD, the Roman world experienced a prolonged period of peace and prosperity. This 200-year period of history is referred to as the Pax Romana. Pax Romana is Latin for Roman peace, and this is a time period that was so stable, so peaceful, so economically prosperous for the Roman world, that in a number of historians view the Pax Romana as being the best time period in history outside of our own modern age. This is a time in which the city of Rome became a teeming metropolis of over a million people. This is a time in which the Roman Empire finished the construction of 50,000 miles worth of roads within its territory. Trade flowed freely throughout the empire as the sea was free of pirates. Water flowed into the cities in the form of baths, fountains uh, for drinking, for cleaning. There were sewers that removed waste from the city. Um, the Romans thought that they were the best people in the world, not just because they thought they were better than everybody else, but because they were cleaner than everyone else as well. Great works of architecture, uh, like the Pantheon that we see here with its domed roof. You could go and be entertained by seeing a play in one of the many fantastic theaters that were built throughout the city of Rome. Uh, you could go watch chariot races in the Circus Maximus, which seated nearly 200,000 people, or you could watch gladiator fights uh, in the Colosseum. All of these are things that we'll discuss at greater length as time goes on. But one unintended long-term consequence develops out of the Pax Romana. And that is because since conditions were relatively peaceful for such a long period of time, Augustus and future emperors continually decreased the number of legions in the military. And as Rome's borders continue to grow in size, we're going to see that there's not going to be enough troops to defend those immense borders. And as a result, invasions by people from outside the empire are going to become more and more and more frequent. 
So we got to see the rise of the first real emperor of Rome, Augustus, and how he, avenging the death of his uncle Caesar, uh, rose to power and became the first emperor. We also met some of the men who ruled after him, uh, the less than stellar Julio Claudians and also the good emperors. We'll talk at greater length about what it was to live during the Pax Romana, so be prepared to cover that, and uh, that'll do.